It's time for the Rose Chat Podcast, a podcast dedicated to celebrating the world's most beloved flower, the rose. Join award-winning gardeners Chris Van Cleef and Teresa Byington as they chat with rose lovers and experts from around the globe. With each episode, you'll gain valuable knowledge and insights to achieve the rose garden you've always dreamed of. Listen now as we explore the world of roses. Hey friends, today we're going to take a look at a very important subject, bridging generations of gardeners. And I'll be chatting one with, with one of my favorite millennials, the delightful Robin Jennings of Heirloom Roses. Hey Robin, welcome back to Rose Chat. Hi, it's great to be with you, Teresa. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so excited for today's chat. You know, I am a seasoned gardener and I certainly want to help others any way I can. So I want to learn how to better do that. But I also think there's much that I learned from those just getting started, their enthusiasm and their fresh ideas. It's a bolster to me. So I'm thinking when we bridge the generations, it's a win-win situation for both of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Robin, let's get started with the new gardeners. What can you tell us about the new gardeners? Oh, gosh, yeah, the new gardeners are super enthusiastic. So we're saying millennials. I think I'm technically an elder millennial, which I hate the term, but um, (laughs) it makes me feel old. But, yeah, so they are the gardeners who started gardening likely right around the pandemic, Mm -hmm. 2020, 2019. They started gardening usually leaning towards vegetables and produce and things like that since we weren't always able to go to the grocery store. Um, And post-COVID, they've changed that over to flower gardens. So they're starting to dip their toes into ranunculus and roses and dahlias and iris and really just creating that beauty in their own space, whatever space they may have. Yeah, that's, you know, that's something that uh, I think we all want. We just, uh, COVID did that to all of us. We looked out and we saw what's out there in our own domain that we have some control over and how can we make it the best ever. For sure. Yeah. And I think a lot of them too have, um, they're either new homeowners or not yet homeowners. So some people are um, gardening on patios, they're doing just pots or decks, or they might have a small yard that they're working with. So they're usually a much smaller garden space. So they're very, very selective in what they're choosing because they don't have a lot of room. So whatever they put in there really has to count. Well, roses just fit right into that because there are so many varieties and so many colors and so many sizes of roses. I mean, there's few plants on the market that have such diversity. So there's really something Mm -hmm. for everyone. Absolutely. So like in our research, what the new gardeners, I'll just call them the new gardeners, they could, they might be older too. They might not all be millennials, but whoever's new to gardening right now. Um, They're really looking for a unique set of roses. They're searching specifically disease resistance. That's really important um, to that customer. And they really don't want to have to spray if they can avoid it. They tend to want things to be more natural. Um, So picking plants that have a high disease resistance is important. They're also searching for climbing roses. They're going vertical which speaks to the limited space that they might have. So climbing roses are really one of our top sellers for new gardeners. Um, Other things that we see trending are like purple, purple roses. I have like three or four purple roses, but I didn't know that other people love them that much. So purple roses are really trending. Um, And then some really well-known names of roses like Eden and Peace Roses. Those are always popular um, among new gardeners. And a funny note is that we commonly have people searching for does a black rose exist? Yeah. Something unique and different. Something unique and different. Yeah. Well, I have plum perfect and I think that's pretty purple. I love it. It's, it just shines out there with all those pink things that I have. (laughs) Do you lean towards pink? Is that your color? Well, for years it was. And then I sort of, I talk about on my blog this week, I sort of, my gateway was, was um, peach, you know, was mother Mm, of pearl. I started going, mother of pearl can go pink or peach. And in my garden, she goes peach. And so I just, that was kind of my gateway color. And so I've been stepping my toe into some other colors too. So, but there were many years that I, you know, it was the dominant, you know, pink group, variations of pink. But um, yeah, the pink's getting, you know, the pink's, you know, having to share some space now with other colors for sure. I think so. I think so. I have plum perfect. I have ebb tide. 
and I have Twilight Zone. So those are all my purples. And I actually, I don't think in real life I gravitate towards purple. I don't wear a lot of purple, but in the garden I do. I guess I do gravitate a little bit towards purple. Now, in my days as a florist, um, a lot of times florist roses are not uh, typically uh, fragrant unless it was the lavender roses and they, the lavender roses that we could get were oftentimes fragrant. So I always think of them as fragrant. Um, but, uh, and that's just another bonus. Well, I want to go back to climbing roses because that just pleases me because one of the things that I just think is the most outstanding thing about roses is their charm and their grace mm-hmm. and their, I love a drapey or a climbing rose. It just sets the stage and there's just nothing like it. You know, an arbor, who doesn't want to walk under an arbor of beautiful roses? So I love that. You know, it's just, uh, it's all the, that charming beauty that roses have to offer. And it's a great way to get a lot of bang for a small space. So, yeah. I mean, you don't need a lot of land space to get a climber going. And then she's going to, you know, if you can spalliate her out, she's just going to go crazy and have all these massive blooms for just a very small actual footprint. So. I can see why new growers are loving them. I personally have started planting them along a chain link fence in my yard to separate me Mm -hmm. from my neighbors. And I think I have James Galloway, Polka, Eden, and Darcy Bustle. So Mm -hmm. I've got quite a few. And I don't have a color palette, apparently. It's just all these different colors, but they each have their own little section. And (laughs) it doesn't take up a big footprint, and I still have room for other plants, but it's a beautiful hedge for me. Oh, it, uh, I can imagine that is beautiful. And I, I have a lot of different climbers and ramblers and that kind of thing. I, I have almost an acre, so I can have that. And it, it doesn't seem to matter about color palette. They just work together. They just know. Mm-hmm. It's just like a rose knows how to blend with another rose for some reason. I mean, the color palette doesn't really, doesn't really matter at all. They just look beautiful together. So yeah. you mentioned Eden. No wonder people love Eden. I mean, Erilyn puts out the most gorgeous photographs of the Eden roses there I've ever seen. So it is a beautiful, beautiful rose. She's so pretty. Eden is, and also pretty in pink Eden is also stunning. So if, if like a light pink isn't your color, you're looking for something with more pop, pretty in pink Eden is gorgeous too. And then I think our other two like major climbers are like New Dawn and Joseph's Coat. Those two sell really well. Mm. Also, yeah. That's 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 neat. I, I tell you, I just absolutely um, love um, climbing roses and what they can bring to the garden. So uh, that's wonderful. And if we can add fragrance and one of the things that we're just so fortunate to uh, be living in a time when we have hybridizers coming up with so many uh, disease resistant roses. I mean, I started mm-hmm. growing roses in a big way in the 80s and, you know, here in the Midwest, it was hard for me to get them through the winter and it was hard for me to keep them, you know, (laughs) with foliage on them at all. So, but that's not the case today. I mean, there are so many power bloomers, beautiful roses out there that just require, I'm surprised at how little they require of me. Yeah. I think we're in a a new era where we can be super picky with roses. I was looking at some here for observation and I'm like, if you're going to get, you know, Uh, powdery mildew easily I'm not really interested because there's a lot of great varieties that don't get it at all so I think our customers and the new growers can be super picky about disease resistant varieties and there's always some great growers like Cordes or Buck Roses that you're not you're going to get really hardy plants and then pair that with own root and it's like a winning ticket right Oh, yeah, absolutely, especially for us in colder climates. It's just a peace of mind. I lost many to cold, and that just doesn't happen anymore. It just simply doesn't happen anymore. Um, For those who are reluctant to um, add roses to the flower gardens, so what do you think is the reason? What's keeping some of them from not choosing roses? I don't think they've been bit by the bug yet. I think uh, you got to get your first rose to become addicted, right? Yeah. So I think there's a lot of bad information out there too about roses. They just seem difficult or fussy or you see like these pristine hybrid teas at hotels or in gardens and you're just like, I could never keep up with that, right? Mm -hmm. And I think you have to choose the rose for the stage of life that you're in. If you have the time and the energy to be dealing with a rose that might be a little particular, but you have the, you know, the time and investment 
willingness to invest in that, then that's great. For me, I mean, I have three small children. I do not have the time for that. So a rose gets about, you know, one growing season in my garden. And if she's not amazing, she's out because that space is valuable. So I tend to like, gravitate more towards like the floribundas, um, which are going to be, you know, those big blooms, fragrant lots of foliage climbers i love climbers obviously i have very you know i have a few hybrid teas but i don't generally lean towards hybrid teas or or i, I don't have space for ramblers that's my thing i don't i just don't have the square footage for that so i think if you find the right rose and you're making sure that you're picking for the right zone then you're going to get something that you're going to be successful with and once you're successful then you've been bit by the bug and you're going to buy another one the next year right well, absolutely. And one of the things I would say to our um, our um, flower farmers is that mm -hmm. there are very few perennials or even annuals that give you the bloom power of um, the right rose. I mean, you can fill tons of vases because I do. I give a lot of flowers away. I grow a lot and I grow a lot of cut flowers and I grow a lot of roses. And I mean, the roses... It, that are out today, they are blooming machines. So you want to look for those and, you know, find people that you trust to, uh, to tell you the truth about roses and, uh, you know, read the fine print and read the label. And um, because there are just some incredibly great roses out there. I too don't grow very many hybrid teas. Um, I'm, I'm a shrub girl. I've got a lot of cordis roses and, and for my climate, that really works. But there, there are some hybrid teas that are great, like Savannah. Savannah is mm. a fabulous. Yeah, that's growth. a good one. Yeah, and you're, I mean, you're, you know, it's just something extra. It looks like something extra, but really, you know, they're no. Many of them are no extra care. I think it was Paul Zimmerman that first coined the phrase that roses are just blooming shrubs. And we do really need to think of them that way. You know, you would take care of any shrub that you planted, give it a little fertilizer. And some of my roses don't even get much fertilizer from me and they do just fine. So anything you plant in your garden is going to require some care, but many of today's roses don't require any more than other shrubs in your garden. Absolutely. Like I, when I first started with roses, and I think I've told this story to you before, I'm not sure if it's on this podcast or not, but I bought a house and it had fragrant cloud in the backyard, which is a hybrid tea. Um, but one bloom, I've cut one bloom when we first moved in and brought it into the kitchen and it filled my whole house. And I was just, that was it. I was obsessed. I wanted more and I wanted to, and it, it I don't do anything to it. It's partially under a second floor deck, so it's slightly shaded. And she's just a powerhouse. Like I went out last night to cut a bouquet for a neighbor and she had probably like 40, 50 blooms on her in, you know, mid-September. So yeah, if you find the right rose that's, you know, disease resistant naturally already, and that's what, you know, hybridizers are going for now, you're going to be successful. And so I think really a lot of education is needed for new growers on how to find the rose that's right for you and not the one that's trending on Instagram in a different zone that you don't live in. <laughs> That is so important. And it's so hard because I am one of those. I see it and I want to have it. I have such rose envy, which is why I, you know, have started each year just just looking at my garden and saying, okay, I want to try some of the new ones. So you, you're you going to have to go to another home. And it's really hard to do, but you can't grow them all. You have to make space. But I mean, this year I was just convinced that I didn't want any rose that wasn't pretty highly fragrant. So I've added a bunch mm -hmm. of fragrance to my roses, uh, to my collection. And I'm telling you, when I walk out there, even now, when things are really winding down here, um, I'm like, this is just wonderful. Of course, 90 degree yeah. weathers, I think they're all just, you know, giving it all they got. But but it's it does make a difference. And there's some beautiful scents out there. I'm, I'm so pleased with some of the new roses that have been released. What do you think is your top fragrant rose that you have? Well, of the new ones, I would say Bolero. Um, mm. Of the older ones that I've had for a long time, I would say Savannah and Quietness. Mm. Both um, great, yeah. Another new one that has been quite fragrant um, is um, Chantilly Cream. Are you familiar Ooh, with I that I don't one? have that one. I don't do a ton of like deep yellow or orange or that sort of, I, I don't do a ton of those, although I'm, I do have Bathsheba and I am creeping in that direction, but, um, um, 
this uh, this one in the picture, I thought, well, this is going to be really, really bright. Well, she's not, and she fades beautifully and lasts in the vase forever. Bolero lasts in the vase forever. I mean, Savannah, some of these are just, they're great in a vase. And I've been, I had a simple surgery, and we won't get into that, of my right hand. So I couldn't be out in the garden as much. So I was cutting like one, I was had all this line of bud vases of different sizes and I just filled my windows with them just so just one row so I could be there. But what I got to do is to see how long these things last and how long they're fragrant in a vase. And that's been, that has been wonderful. State of grace will last forever for me and Chantilly cream was lasting forever. So, so that was just, you know, been a little sideline thing, but some of these, you know, you just, uh, it's wonderful just to pop something, you know, a little more romantic, a little more epic, like a rose into your bouquet. And it just kind of ups the level, I think. That's First some thing- great research there. I need to put a full line of them on my windowsill and observe. Yes. Too. That's a great idea. Well, we've now done it three times and I had a friend come over and she saw them in my kitchen window and she goes, well, I need a minute. I just have to stand here. So right now <laughs> there's nothing there. My husband said, where's our a window display but it has been so fun you know just a few little I mean it's been really fun and great you know a great education for me when people ask these things so Mm -hmm. let's see another one um we're going to get into what you'd recommend for newbies but another one that I'm quite enchanted with is uh, bliss and earth angel those are two that are are doing pretty well for me too oh earth angel is a stunner that's a stunner I think for in my garden Currently, I'm obsessing with Amazing Grace. She just has such thick stems that I feel like, I, and such large, large blooms. I think they're like six, seven inch blooms. I can cut just one and she kind of like is a powerhouse in the bouquet that I make. Like she's a statement wow. piece. And also I'm really into Madame and set right now. Um, that is a Cortez the, from the Parfuma series. And um She's growing much bigger than I've ever seen her grow. The first year I planted her, she had five foot canes, which I thought was pretty phenomenal. (laughs) Now she's in year three. And yesterday I went out and I stood, I'm five foot six. I stood next to it and I held my hands as high as I could, holding my shears on top of my head. And she was, she had canes that were almost nine foot tall. So I think I'm going to prune her back a little bit, but she has the most delightful um, clusters of blooms in a licorice, anise scent Mm -hmm. that is just, just delightful. You may have to put her on a tall obelisk or something to kind of control her. <laughs> I know. I accidentally planted her near a pathway, and she's pretty upright growth habit, but she's so, like, domineering in this space. I think I might need to move her to an edge or something, but I do love her a lot. <laughs> well, she sounds beautiful, and you've told me about her before, but I don't mm-hmm. have her. But, you know, she might be on my list. Um, so do you have a few that you would recommend for our new gardeners who just tipping their toe into the rose world? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just going to go with my favorites. Of course, amazing grace is a, a, a great, really fragrant, um, shrub. She's, she's always the first to bloom in my garden actually, which is just, is exciting. Um, Madame Anaset has had very little care from me this year, and she's delightful. Sunbelt South Africa is a really good one. It's also a Cordes if you're looking for something in those gold or yellowy tones. Um, Braveheart is a red shrub that does really well with minimal care. Um, and then I also have Lagerfell, which is a grand of flora hmm. that um, it's kind of that like a silvery purple. It's such a unique color. Um, but she's got big blooms too, and she's not fussy at all. So those are a couple that we recommend, you know, um, Summer Romance is another one. If you're looking for a deep pink, really heavily uh, ruffled and petaled fragrant rose, she's kind of that quartered blooms where you can almost divide the bloom into four equal parts because she's so heavily petaled. Um, and then Claire Austin, I got to throw a David Austin in there. That is probably our top selling Austin, which surprises me that it's, it's white. Like she's Austin. white, right? And she white? Kind of white with a little bit of a creamy hue to her. And she does okay in some partial shade, but she's about three and a half inches with a lemon fragrance. So she's a really good rose if you can get her. Well, I just thought of this one that's new to me, but has done so, so, so well. And that is Veranda Cream. And she would be fabulous um, in a container on someone's patio or or um, um, deck. 
she is beautiful and it's a creamy, rich bloom and uh, fragrant. It's just really nice. Mm -hmm. Does she um, lean more pink in your garden or does she lean a little bit more apricot? Apricot. Yeah. I would say apricot. Same with, uh, with mother of pearl. As I mentioned, a lot of people say that she's pink, but she's definitely more peach in my garden. So I don't know what that means, but there you have it. I think that's important for new growers to know too, is that your zone and your weather conditions really do affect the color of the blooms. Robin, now let's talk about what the younger rose growers need or maybe want from a seasoned gardener. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think the number one thing is education. It's definitely, they need, they want to know how do I care for this rose? What do I do now that I've bought it wherever I've bought it I've purchased it I've brought it home and now what what do I do and so I think there's a lot of education that needs to be done and the experienced growers those members of the American Rose Society or master gardeners they have this wealth of information I mean I was just like I said at the ARS convention uh, uh, this past month and the amount of people there that know a thousand times more than I do about roses is like <laughs> everybody, everybody knows more than me. And so every time I go, I learn something new and I'm writing and I'm taking notes. So I think just don't underestimate what you have to offer, the information that you have to offer and share, because there's so much, um, not only like, how do I grow this plant, but what type of rose do I choose? What's the difference between the types of roses? Does it matter what zone I'm in? So I think that's where the American Rose Society and master gardeners in local zones can speak to the fellow growers in that same zone. They can offer, you know, for our zone six, these are the roses that do the best. For our zone nine, these are the ones that are really heat tolerant. Things like that to help them make an educated choice and then continue offering ongoing support for um, rose ailments. I mean, there's so many Facebook groups that all they are is pictures of leaves going, what's wrong with this plant? <laughs> and I think so many people know what's wrong with the plant, but it's some of those groups sometimes tend to be the blind leading the blind. And someone's like, oh, definitely gall. And I'm like, no, that's not gall, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I think it's really important to be where those growers are. And if that's in a, you know, in a Facebook group, or if that's at a local farmer's market, just being where they are and offering your expertise. So how do they prefer to receive the information? You mentioned a farmer's market and having people on hand there would definitely work. What are some other ways that they would they would receive this education? Yeah, so I mean, the farmer's market is like, or if your community does like a, like a community day, like my town does a little like Thursday nights, the first Thursday of the month and having a little booze, like asking me about your roses, like, I would be all over that and standing in line like I have questions. So I think that would be a great option. Um, they prefer to, this generation of growers prefers their information to be short and sweet and usually in a video format, which I know is not everybody's favorite. But if your local group has a Instagram account or a TikTok account or a Facebook account to be posting, you know, 30 to 60 second short videos on a very specific topic and using lots of describing words in the caption, like today we're going to talk about, you know, rose rosette disease and show you pictures of what it looks like. That's going to make someone click and they're going to watch that video all the way through and they're going to learn something and you're going to start to become the expert, which is going to make them come back for more. And, and the benefit of that is not only new interaction with younger growers, but you're also sharing your love of roses and creating, you know, the next rose obsession for someone else. <laughs> Absolutely. That's very easy to happen. That is very easy to happen. Um, now, how likely are they to attend a local meeting? That's a hard question. Um, <laughs> I've attended local Rose, Rose show meetings with my local Rose group here in Portland. Um, I think those who have already purchased several roses, they might attend a meeting. But like any social club or group, it really depends on how they're received when they get there, right? Mm -hmm. So if they walk in and they're walking into a group of longtime friends, which a lot of, you know, social clubs are, and they feel like an outsider, they're not going to come back. So it's really important that if you see a young person at your 
society meeting that you like approach them and welcome them and encourage them and ask them if they have questions and come sit. I mean, as silly as this is to say, come sit with me. That's a big deal to mm -hmm. feel included and inclusive and that I'm wanted here. And that just creates um, a safe space to ask questions that the new grower might think are really silly um, and they're embarrassed to ask, but the longtime Rosarian just knows this information in the back of their mind. So I think it might be hard to get them to come just out of the blue, but if you're creating that content online, if you're creating videos and you're creating, you know, open forums where people can ask questions, which I know the ARS's new website has that, um, that's going to encourage them to take that step and come out. And it might take an invitation. It might take, you know, mm -hmm. posting on your feed, like, we would love to have you come out. We're going to answer questions. Bring, a, you know, bring a leaflet that you have questions about, and we'll help you identify what's wrong with it. People will show up for things like that when they know that there's a tangible or a, a reward that they will get from making that very vulnerable first step of attending a meeting where you don't know anyone. You know, that made, as you were saying all of that, I was thinking, you know, that in um, when a board is planning what they're going to do for the next year, I think that working in things that are very, very down to earth or having certain meetings that are for the seasoned um, grower and, you know, activities, that kind of thing, but also have very succinct meetings for how to's that you can promote to the community would be very helpful, I think, as you have described that, you know, the yes, how-tos, sure. you know, like the how-tos, like we're going to talk about, you know, we're going to take you from A to Z on roses. Um, and we always at our meetings have uh, a round table at the end so people can ask their questions, bring their leaves and all of that. So ask the experts kind of a thing. And it's, you know, and everyone, even the experts are asking, you know, I saw this and I've never seen this before. So, um, but I think being intentional about, you know, taking care of, of course, our core group, but also planning for the ones who aren't there yet and who are trying to take that next step. So, so I can yeah, see just keeping an bad. eye out for the yeah keeping an eye out for the visitor like mm -hmm. who doesn't whose face don't I recognize and like you were saying advertising things that are specific to the new grower like this meeting is the first half of the meeting is predominantly going to be an introduction to roses even types of roses or talking about where do you buy roses they they want to know that there's a lot of Facebook groups where people are like tell me a reputable buyer. I mean, I'm always yeah. just the heirloom, but people are telling me where to buy the roses. So things like that, that is just common knowledge that all these rosarians have. It is so easy to share. There's always something new to learn. I, I just remember when I when I joined my local society, I'd been growing roses for years and decided to join the local society. And um, so, you know, I thought it pretty much I didn't think I knew it all, but I knew a lot. I was amazed. I mean, I was probably growing at that time 50, 75 roses. There were people there growing 400 roses. They'd been growing them for 50 years. I learned so much just being in that group through the years. It was amazing. So I came for the roses, but I really came because I thought, well, I want to see what other people are doing that like what I like, that love what I love, and just yes. kind of check it out. But then you get close to the people. So it becomes a, it does become social and it becomes, you know, it's about the roses, but it's also about the community that you build around the things that you love. And that becomes absolutely special. And we yes. can't do that all on video, but, but we can set the stage for them to have that if they choose to have it. Yeah, absolutely. So what are, let's see, what else do I have here that I want to talk about while I've got you? Oh, let's talk about heirloom. We haven't talked about heirloom. What's going on out there? Oh, I'm always happy to talk about heirloom. Um, we're doing great. We're doing great. Just it's uh, the fun thing is that people think like, oh, rose season's winding down, but rose season I feel like is never winding down at heirloom roses. Um, so we're working. The marketing team is getting real busy, and we're planning out next year, and we're going to have, gosh, I think over twenty. Uh, new introductions to share with the world. Some are new to heirloom. Um, some are 
uh, from the ARS Rambler, Save the Ramblers initiative mm -hmm. that we've been partnering with to bring some of Ann Belovich's collection that is nearing extinction back into market. So we're really excited about that. Mm -hmm. I really don't want these roses to be lost. So those are going to be like a first come, first serve, and a portion of all the proceeds of those will go back to the Save the Ramblers initiative, which is really exciting. Um, and we're also bringing in some new to market roses. Uh, we've been able to partner with an excellent hybridizer from uh, my home country of Canada, Brad Jalbert. And so we're oh, bringing in yes, some yeah. new, wonderful, wonderful roses that have uh, never been sold before. And I'm really, really excited about them. They're so uh, disease resistant and hardy. I feel like Brad is almost the Canadian version of Griffith Buck. He mm -hmm. creates these beautiful roses and really they've got to do well on their own. He doesn't give them a lot of attention. So you know that these are just fail proof roses. And I also love that um, Brad's plants, the foliage is just as beautiful as the blooms, like yeah. such glossy, beautiful foliage. So even when it's not in bloom, which they usually always are, the foliage yeah. stands alone. So Oh, I am so excited about this. I followed him for years on, I think it's Facebook, and his roses are fantastic. And I wondered if we'd ever, you know, get them into the country. I mean, they're just amazing. Just, they've been blowing me away for years. So this is really good news. Yes, very, very exciting. So I tried for our first year, we picked some very different colors. There's something for everyone. Um, and then in subsequent years, we'll just keep seeing more and more of his amazing um collection making its way south of the border here into oh, the United States nice. and and we'll be able to also ship them across Canada because now heirloom was able to ship to Canada which is a really big deal it is a big deal I'm very happy mm -hmm. about that what else is going on um I, get, I think we're just doing a lot of education right now so a lot of education on fall planting um for a lot of the country we're getting closer and closer to the first frost so unlike some like bare root roses because we're own root you can really plant any time and i think for me in zone eight and a few friends of mine in zones of six and seven fall planting just seems to be the best for us as far as getting the roses established before winter and getting blooms earlier in the spring so we're busy shipping out plants every day and um, just walking among the roses on my lunch break i think oh my goodness that sounds wonderful now <clears throat> for those who might be new to heirloom, tell us a little bit about the process. Uh, what's going to happen if they order a rose from heirloom? What's it going to look like when it comes? Oh, absolutely. So heirloom, um, we only do own root roses. So that's a plant that is not grafted and it's, it's same roots match the top of the plant. So you're all the same variety in one which really increases the chance of the rose uh, surviving winter damage or being run over with a lawnmower, which happens <laughs> from time to time. Um, it's always going to come back true to variety. So all the roses at Heirloom are propagated by hand on site. We do extensive viral testing on each of our roses, which has really picked up this year. I mean, I can't even read all the words in the panel that we're testing for because there's so many different um, rose diseases that are known or unknown that we're testing for. And so once a plant comes to the nursery, it has to be perfectly clean before they'll even bring it in near the propagation area. And then we start propagating it off it. And um, it takes about 18 months for the plant to go from a cutting to a gallon pot that's 12 to 18 inches high and shippable. And so customers will receive their rose in a gallon, industry size gallon pot with a beautiful bamboo cane in it to keep it from tossing around in the box. And it'll be defoliated. We do defoliate before we ship. I mean, at the nursery right now, everything has leaves and blooms on it, but we find that the plants do better in transit and have a lot less moisture loss and uh, just fare better once they mm -hmm. arrive if they're defoliated prior to shipping. So we do strip the leaves and then we pack it in that box and ship it. And I have to tell you a funny story. I walked out to the nursery uh, shipping area few months ago and I was watching the team throwing boxes like throwing rose boxes in the air and I said what are you guys doing and they were like just being a rough day at the shipping company and so they were testing to see how yes. hard you had to really chuck the boxes to make sure the rose was still intact no broken canes you know all that stuff so it was really funny 
because they were launching them pretty hard. That's very, very important, though. Some of them go very far. You know, you're out there. I'm in the middle and people are out east. So, yeah, <laughs> they've got to go. I, sometimes the delivery guy has a bad day. So they were just making sure that they were they were surviving. And I love it that we do wrap our pot so there's no loose dirt or anything. I'm sure you've received plants in the oh, mail yes. before. and It's just a box of dirt. So we're really particular about that. Um, so yeah, that's how they arrive and then they're all ready for planting. So if anyone's interested in getting a rose for their garden or they're ready to, you know, take the plunge into roses, now is a perfect time to be ordering. And we do have a um, lovely calendar on our website where you can pick the day you want them to be delivered. So mm -hmm. if you're like, my first frost is in four weeks, I can have the rose in the next two weeks, then you pick the day that you want it to be delivered and we'll make sure it gets there. Or if you're in a colder zone, and it's already too close to your first frost or it's getting closer, you can buy your rose now and say, send it to me, you know, May 1st. And that's fine too. Okay. I said I only had one more thing, but actually I now have two more things that I want you to talk about before I let you go. Number one, your guarantee. And number two, tell us about what you do at Erwin. Sure, of course. So our guarantee, I think, really makes it a foolproof way to grow roses. We do have a one-year guarantee on any rose that you purchase from us. But as long as you plant it and you made an effort to grow it um, and it died or it didn't survive the winter, we'll replace it for free. And our customer care team is so lovely. You can just contact them via email or give them a phone call and they'll be able to look up your order and either help you save the rose if it's currently dying or um, ship you a new one. So we really just want everyone to be successful. And I, I just love that about our company that if you're trying, we want to help you um, achieve the garden that you really want. That's wonderful. I love this. So now to you. To me, yes. So um, I am the senior brand marketing manager at Heirloom Roses. So I get the pleasure and joy of interacting with rosarians and experts on how to grow roses, what roses are trending. I do a lot of market research as far as what hybridizers are bringing to market. I get to do a lot of observation of roses that are being considered for the new market. So I get to, I guess, pick roses. It's kind of fun. I smell them all day long. I walk around in them. I carry them around with me. The other day I brought a, a new rose that might be coming to market into the marketing um, house and I was showing my team and I said, I can't figure out this scent. Can someone help me identify what this smells like? And one team member said it smelt like a church lady. And another one said it smelt like a fruity IPA. <laughs> so I think, I think I settled on that rose smells like a church lady having a beer on a hot day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ha I have that rose for sure. <laughs> no, no, I got to come up with some better, like smell it some more and find the notes in it, really. Yeah. But that was a good first stab, I thought. <laughs> well, and, and we and we'd all need a little humor in our life for sure. We do. We have a lot of fun at Erlen. We've got a really great marketing team and a really great um, propagation team. We're not a, a super big company, but we're really a great family and we work together really well. And everyone's just partnering together to make our wor world more beautiful one rose at a time. And you're doing a wonderful job. My, er my uh, roses are doing very well. First year right out of the box. I'm telling you, I've been very, very pleased. So just appreciate all that you do. And I so appreciate your joining me today. You've given us so much great information. You've helped us connect dots and you've helped us improve our lines of communication. And you've told us what roses are going to do well for us. So thank you so very much. Oh, it's my pleasure. And if anyone listening has not yet taken a step at roses or they want to expand their rose collection, I'm happy to offer a discount code of ROSECHAT24. And that'll give them 20% off all roses now through December 31st, 2024. So the code is ROSECHAT24. ROSECHAT24 for 20%. That's a great discount. Thank you. It is. Thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Well, friends, it came. Fall is here and true to form. Some of my roses did indeed save their best blooms for last, but they're fading and that frost date is coming. While I'm looking at these beautiful blooms, my locust trees are dropping their leaves at a record speed. So 
Get out there and enjoy your blooms while you can. Don't forget about the discount code. That's a great code. And take a look at their website. There's so much beauty there and information, a lot of education and videos. So there's much to come. Well, until next time, friends, happy gardening. You've been listening to the Rose Chat Podcast with Chris Van Cleve and Teresa Byington, expert rose gardeners who want to help you achieve the rose garden of your dreams. Don't miss an episode. Listen anytime on our website at rosechatpodcast.com or listen on the go via the Rose Chat app on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Share this podcast with your social networks and join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by using the hashtag Rose Chat. Join us next time for another edition of the Rose Chat Podcast. The Rose Chat Podcast is a production of the Rose Chat Media Group, Birmingham, Alabama.